Uh, before I get started, I would like to thank you, Brent, for cajoling me into doing this because uh, a lot of the stuff you're about to see has only been known for the last uh, four or five years, and some of it actually for less than a year because I tried for I don't know how many years to get a copy of my dad's service records. The problem was the Ministry of Defence would only issue them to you if you mailed them a written application accompanied by a cheque for £30 sterling made out against a UK bank in your name. Well, I haven't had a UK bank account for almost 40 years, so that wasn't going to work. One of the good things that came out of the pandemic was just before Christmas in 2021, and they finally started accepting email applications and payment by credit card. So of course I jumped right on that, sent in my application, and in February of last year, actually on my birthday, I got the best birthday present ever, I got an email saying, hey, uh, here, here's your dad's service records. Got all excited, opened it up, this is what I got. <laughs> And this, this one is all his uh, personal uh, height, weight, where to send his belongings if he gets killed and all that stuff. This is his actual service record, this piece here. So throughout the presentation today you'll see blown up excerpts from this and I'll explain it as we go along. It, it filled in some gaps but it also created almost as many questions as it answered. However, so my dad was Harry Mike Bell. At the end of his career, he was a flight sergeant in the Royal Air Force. What this is all about is really my story as to how did a working class lad from Scotland from a coal mining family end up in charge of electrical maintenance for an entire squadron of B-24 Liberators and certified as a flight engineer. So let's start with who was he? This takes a little bit. Sabina McManaman was my grandmother. I'd never met my grandparents, but she was, she was born in Western Ireland, as far west as you can go before you go paddling in the Atlantic. And in the mid-1880s, she and some other members of her family moved to the US, and she got married to Thomas Burke in Sugar Notch, Pennsylvania. They started a family, but... Uh, she wore him out pretty quickly and he died in the mid-1890s. So, <clears throat> so uh, she moved with her kids back to Ireland, but uh, the, the reason she had left in the first place was no work, so to get work she moved from Ireland over to Prestwick in Scotland where she got work as a servant on a farm. In parallel with that, my grandfather Hugh Bell, who was a coal miner, he married Mary McCarroll, and between them, they had 14 kids. But she died in 1902, big surprise. And, uh, <laughs> and in 1903, these, these two uh, uh, widows, the widow and widower met and got married, and they had three more kids between them. And that was uh, Robert, my dad Harry, and George. Now, uh, if we look at all this lot, at the time that uh, they got married, there were still nine of, of Hugh's kids living at home with them. So they, they, if we look at it then, four of the kids died ve very young as children. One so young that uh, so soon after birth she was, was never given a name, and our twin sister died the next day. <coughs> Two of them, Thomas and George, died in coal mine accidents, Thomas when he was only 14. Four of uh, my uncles, Francis, uh, uh, James, Hugh and John, fought in World War I and two of, them, two of them died, the other two were injured. We'll talk a bit more about John in a moment. Now of those 20 children, uh, I knew three. Obviously knew my father, my dad Harry, his brother from my uncle Bob, and my uncle John. They were the only ones I ever knew. To add a little more flavour to just what a wonderful life this was, they lived in a, the family lived in a row of coal miner houses. So it was a row of six houses. And each house had uh, two rooms. So it was a little crowded in there. And then just to add to the pleasures, 
there was one outhouse toilet for every three houses. So, so let's just say that living conditions were somewhere just below disgusting, you know. Where did he come from? Well, everybody has heard of the United Kingdom, but some people don't, don't properly understand what that means. It's an abbreviation for the United Kingdom of Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland. Great Britain being the main island, then Northern Ireland over here. My grandmother came from right out here in Bill Mullet. Great Britain consists of Scotland, Wales and England. That, uh, the Scotland, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland being the three Celtic nations. And I always joke that they, they kind of uh, fight among each other like brothers until an Englishman shows up. <laughs> <laughs> so if we zoom in on where, where they were living a little more, and we see southern Scotland, you see some things you might start to recognise like Edinburgh and Glasgow. Zoom way in closer, and what you see is central Ayrshire. And there you have the town of uh, Draghorn, where my dad was born and brought up, that today has a population of about uh, 3,500. And to the, just about three miles to the east is the village of Cross House, where my parents settled after the war, and that's where I was born and brought up. It has a population today of about 2,800. Kids used to get annoyed with me because I would always tease them that there were more students in their high school than there were people in my village. <laughs> but, uh, some things of note here that as uh, Kilmarnock here, which is where I went to high school, is among other things the home of Johnny Walker Whiskey. So that was a, that was a good start. <coughs> the, uh, then any golfers in the room will have heard of Troon, where the uh, British Open is often hel held. Then down here, just down the coast, you have Prestwick. And Prestwick Airport uh, was one of my stomping grounds when I was a kid, but uh, some of you may not know, the mighty 8th Air Force, the very first aircraft that flew to the UK, flew from New England to Greenland, Greenland to Iceland, Iceland to Prestwick. So that was the first, first place wheels touched in the UK. Now that later became a, a modification depot because it was the home of Scottish aviation because the, the planes that the Royal Air Force had, the British planes, the factories in the US were turning these planes out so fast they couldn't accommodate all the customization that the Brits wanted. So there would be modification depots that the new aircraft would fly into and get the British radio equipment and IFF gear and whatever gun systems they wanted on board, all that stuff done locally. Now, before I get into the details on my dad, a couple of things that are worth mentioning of my family before World War II. This is a, a local newspaper report from end of May 1915. That date becomes significant in a minute. What this is saying that the, the newspaper was recognizing the fact, remember that in World War I there was no conscription, so enlistment was voluntary. And they were uh, commending this family for having four sons who enlisted and signed up. One of which has already been killed, that was my uncle Francis in Battle of the Somme. And the, the, the three others had been wounded. But uh, as uh, Monty Python would put it, it must have been a flesh wound. Because uh, within two weeks they were back at the front fighting again. And this uh, photograph is from World War II, I'm using it here because it's got my Uncle John in it. But what this is all about is two of my dad's brothers, my Uncle Hugh and my Uncle John, joined up together in September 14, in 1914. John actually lied about his age because he was only 18 at the time. And they were, they, they were in the Royal Scots Fusiliers, John was 1st Battalion, Hugh was in 2nd. And on the 16th of June, so that's only two weeks after the, the previous thing where they were noted as being wounded, they were fighting 25 miles apart in Flanders, of fields of poppies fame, uh, in Givenchy, uh, France. And the cruel twist of fate was that on that same day, Hugh was killed, his body was never found, or at least never uh, identified, and he's commemorated on the Latouri Memorial in France. John. Uh, was seriously wounded with multiple bullet and shrapnel wounds and lost his right eye. Uh, the thing that I thought, uh, and actually uh, this, 
th those weren't flesh wounds, so he actually got discharged from the army 10 days later. The thing that was really cool is that in the 100th anniversary of that, a distant cousin of mine, John's grandson Graham, went to the Latouri uh, a memorial and laid a wreath while his cousin Alison simultaneously laid a wreath at the Dreghorn War me Memorial. What that brings up is that at least in Scotland every city, town and village has a war memorial. There are no exceptions that I know of. And in my dad's uh, little town of Dreghorn the war memorial sits up in the, the, the highest hilltop uh, overlooking the town looks like this, which uh, is pretty typical for, uh, for the style of these memorials. The larger cities and things would have a whole building with wall plaques and all that stuff. But these uh, in the towns, they put that together and we're going to talk about this central part here. If we look in on that, what you see is that uh, the name of every local person who was lost is inscribed on the memorial. What this uh, brought up for me was that uh, early last year we had an Air Force colonel in here talking, I think he was an F-15 driver. One of the things he pointed out was that everybody gets to die twice, the second time being when nobody remembers your name. This is how we in Scotland try to make sure the names don't get forgotten. So there we have uh, my uncle uh, Francis, Battle of the Somme, Uncle Hugh in Flanders, and uh, cousin Robert in, in Egypt. Now, the way these things work, obviously the names are in the alphabetical order and continue all the way around, but uh, the top part that you see here is used for World War I. The bit down below the base is used for World War II. That's because when the memorial was made, there wasn't supposed to be a need for a bottom part. The village that I grew up in, war memorials on a raised mound in, flint, in front of the village church, and uh, uh, thankfully I don't have any family names on that one. But it's got a couple of good inscriptions. The, the World War I inscription is fairly standard, but the one I particularly like is the World War II inscription, because it says that it's not the burden of responsibility for wars past, it's the responsibility to make sure it doesn't happen again. So, getting back to my dad. In 1924, my dad and his older brother uh, Bob, ages 18 and 20, moved to Sugar Notch, Pennsylvania to live with uh, their mother's cousin. I'm pretty sure she encouraged that because she knew that their living and working prospects in southern Scotland were uh, abysmal. And, uh, they'd be much better off here. Of course, the only problem was that was right in the middle of, pro of prohibition. And from things Dad told me, they got up to all kinds of shenanigans. <laughs> they, uh, we won't go into that here, but uh, yeah, I'm sure you guys all know that the concept of no alcohol is completely alien and inconceivable to a Scotsman. So then my uncle Bob moved back to, to Scotland after a few years. Interesting thing about this is that I've got very detailed records, ships, passengers lists and the like, of people moving from Scotland to the US. There's nothing online about anybody moving the other way. So I don't know when he moved back exactly. Now, but they were both working in the Pennsylvania coal mines. But while my dad was working as a coal miner there, he took correspondence course classes. And through that, he, he got a diploma as an electrician in April of 27, and then a second one as a fully-fledged electrical engineer in May of 1932. And he moved back to Scotland in the 1936 time frame, where he found employment as an electrician. And then he, he married my mum in 1938, and my oldest brother George was born later that year. So George is the oldest, I'm the youngest, and we're 18 years apart. So I know that one of us was an accident, the other was a mistake, but I don't know which way around it was. <laughs> then, of course, along comes World War II. And uh, on 3rd of September, 1939, my uncles Bob and John both joined the Dreghorn Home Guard. The Home Guard was uh, a voluntary 
uh, service unit available to anybody who didn't meet the requirements for regular service. That might be a, a reserved occupation, uh, too young, too old. Now, obviously, in the case of my Uncle John, it would be a medical thing. So. But what these guys would do is things like uh, patrol the coastline for any enemy agents trying to sneak off a ship or submarine, uh, track down and apprehend downed airmen, guard the aircraft wreckage until the intelligence forces could uh, get to it and go over it, all that kind of thing. And basic uh, policing services as well. At that point my dad had enlisted but uh, he was waiting to be called up. Now, in the meantime, it's often uh, referred to as the Phony War in late 1939, early 40. The three brothers were still together and still managing to have some fun. One of the stories my dad told me about was that uh, both Bob and John had service ri rifles being, in, being active home guard. And one night, on the way home from the pub, uh, they uh, made a bet and John proved his marksmanship skills and won by in a single shot, he took the tail off the, the <laughs> weather vane cockerel on top of the church. <laughs> Luckily they weren't caught and it's all been repaired. But <laughs> then comes uh, my dad's call up. And that was, he was called up on the 16th of December 1940. And first thing there, uh, the, the US and the UK would pretend to speak the same language but we keep enough degrees of separation for plausible deniability. And wh one of them is we, we all, the UK always does it uh, day, month, year. And for, so we, we agree on the date 12 times a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he gets called up on the 16th. On the 17th, he gets taken on board into the RAF reserves. And then on the 18th of January, he is deployed down to number two recruitment centre in Cardington in England, where he's assigned to number four wing home recruitment centre, which must have been a boot camp of some sort. After about uh, uh, six weeks of that, at the end of February, he goes to number 14 school, school of technical training, then in July to number 11 school of technical training, then in this December to the school of technical instruction, and finally we get told where he is, he's in Halton. <laughs> so what you see out of this is that after the first three lines, everything is handwritten. Uh, the handwriting varies from pretty good, like here, to almost totally illegible. And uh, even the acronyms used are not consistent. It kind of depends on who wrote it and who they were in. But the bottom line is, his technical training continued all the way through 1941. This here is uh, one of the, the uh, training classes that he was in. A couple of things jump out at, to, to me at, at this. The first one is, uh, as you said in your presentation, Terry, that they start off looking all young and happy. And uh, my dad's at age 35 is clearly the grandfather of the bunch. But if you look at these three in the middle, they really jump out to me as to how young they are. And then this guy, who's clearly the officer in charge, every, every time I look at him, it reminds me of one time I got pulled over for something, and this young, spotty-faced police officer appears at the side of my car, and it was so hard not to ask him if he was playing hooky from high school. <laughs> 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 so, all the names are signed on the back of this photograph, but there's absolutely nothing who's who, so it's kind of meaningless to me. In May of 1941, my dad and one of my mother's brothers, my uncle Hugh, met up in London and met up with a family friend. And for this photograph, my dad told me that they had gone together for a pub lunch. And this photograph was when they were helping their friend home. <laughs> but if you look at the stand and the expressions, I'm pretty sure that help was mutual. <laughs> uh, the training that he was going through, examples of, of that are, uh, I guess I should mention, at this point, my dad had never been near an airplane. He'd probably seen some barnstorming demos in his time in the US, but he didn't know anything about airplanes. He was an electrician. 
So his first trade manual is this one, which cost the princely sum of five shillings, which, if anybody doesn't know, the UK didn't use decimal currency until I was in high school, somewhere around 1970. Before that, they regarded the decimal system as being for people who had to count on their fingers. You know, but, but, and what it was back then was there were 12 pennies in a shilling, there was 20 shillings in a pound. So this was a quarter of a, of a pound, so... It's multiplied by the exchange rate. But this is the, the 1940 ed edition, which is, has now been upgraded to include magnetos. So it was you know, <laughs> latest and greatest. Then he had these two. By the way, uh, all this stuff that I've got here, if anybody's welcome to come and look at it and have a flick through it, uh, there's no problem with that. Some of it is quite fascinating. These two are the... Uh, Admiralty manuals that between them covered all the radio and uh, navi radio navigation equipment that was available at the time. So that was they would be quite tightly controlled documents, especially because of the uh, uh, IFF gear and radar gear. Then a little later in his in, in his service, but I just dropped it in here to, for ease of the things, is my favourite of the manuals, which was the survival manual, which is this one right here. Now, if what nowadays people in the military go through SEER training, you know, it's survival, evasion, escape, and rescue training. It takes several weeks, probably two or three months. I don't know, somewhere around there. It's pretty intensive. For my dad, he was given that book, told, read this, it's got all you need to know. That was his training. <laughs> Guess it was great if you had a photographic memory or something. Then come along the squadron assignments. So in January of 1942, he's assigned to 277 Squadron down here in Martlesham Heath, down in Suffolk, which was a major RAF fighter base uh, with Spitfires and Hurricanes, because it was just uh, due west of Germany. Now my dad was uh, working as a, an electrical maintenance guy for, for uh, Westland Lysanders. Which is, it's an interesting plane in its own right in that uh, it, it's got things that were quite advanced for the day and it had a fully trimmable stabilizer, fully automatic slats and flaps, piloted no control over them whatsoever. So you, you had to be a bit careful in your glide slope management so they didn't retract when you were low and slow. <coughs> but um, it was, it's an excellent example of the early war years where the Royal Air Force was really still being driven by army mindsets and doctrines. The requirements for this aircraft had been developed between the wars and it was based on the need for an observation uh, aircraft that could operate deep behind enemy lines and help with artillery spotting and things, had to be able to operate out of very short, unprepared fields. So, did all that great, it just uh, didn't do so well when it came up against an ME-109. <laughs> and so, and so in, in 1940 alone, there had been 175 of these deployed to France, and in two months, in the early part of 1940, 118 of those were shot down. So they were pulled back to the UK and relegated to target tug duty and then at the fighter bases they were used for uh, finding and uh, helping rescue downed airmen in the, uh, the North Sea and the English Channel. Now throughout the course of the war, 277 Squadron was actually credited with rescuing 598 down the airmen. So, uh, if my dad was involved with even one of those, I'd be pretty proud. So it, it did that fairly well, but uh, when it really came into its own was uh, uh, a little later when the special operations executive took a bunch of these and modified them. And what they did was they, they would be operating at night, so they painted them black. They put a long-range fuel tank on there. They put an access ladder to the rear of the cockpit where they'd installed a bench seat where one person could sit in there or you could squeeze two in if they were prepared to be very friendly. The, uh, and this was used to insert and extract agents in and out of France and to fly in the supply 
for the French resistance. It did very well at that. And my dad was only there for, for uh, five months, so at uh, the end of May 1942, he got moved over to 286 Squadron. And I loved their squadron motto, we exercise our defences. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it started off, he was at Zeals, which I think is in Somerset, for about four or five weeks. Then he was moved over to Hawkinge in Kent. Hawkinge was a huge fighter base because, as you can see with its proximity to France, it was, for a fighter it was only six minutes flying time away. So that base was under attack all the time. Now they had all kinds of different aircraft there, uh, hurricane spitfires, and then they had, they had seaplanes to, to go and rescue the people if they were found floating, bobbing up and down somewhere. Uh, and, but the one that my dad spoke about most was the Bolton Paul Defiant. And uh, we'll talk a bit, mo bit more about that the painting in a moment. But the, the Defiant was uh, developed against a new idea that it, it, it's reminiscent of a hurricane when you first look at it with the inward folding un undercarriage and closed cockpit, but it had no forward firing weapons. Instead, it had a four gun machine gun turret behind the cockpit. It saw its combat debut over to the evacuation of Dunkirk, where it performed very well. In one day, the Defiance shot down 37 German aircraft. That was because the German doctrine at the time was you attack a fighter from above and behind. Well, the, you're looking down the barrel of four machine guns if you do that. <laughs> they also didn't expect a fighter to be able to shoot sideways. But of course, the Germans weren't stupid, so it didn't take them long to figure out what was going on and realize this thing can't shoot downwards. Well, you got to get underneath it. But at that point, they started to get slaughtered, so they were, they were uh, pulled back for a while and, and used for aerial gunnery training. But by the time my dad uh, got involved with them, because the, the Dunkirk was uh, mid-1940, so by the time my dad got involved with them in mid-42, these had also found uh, a second life as a night fighter, which is what you see here, where it's painted black. And what they would do is uh, they, would, they would go out and fly at relatively low altitudes and scan the night sky for the silhouettes of German bombers coming in and then go up underneath them and, and take them out. And that, they worked, that worked very well. They performed very well doing that. But uh, uh, a little side story that my dad told me about was uh, one of his fellow electricians was uh, had, having a bit of a problem with one of the pilots. Anybody in the room that's dealt with fighter pilots knows they can be a little bit of a different breed sometimes. And uh, the, uh, this uh, pilot was constantly complaining about his turret misbehaving. This poor electrician tried everything to figure out what was going wrong. And it all checked out fine. So eventually he had to go and tell this pilot that there's nothing wrong with his turret that he can find. This pilot got really upset and said, God damn it, it obviously only does it in the air. Get in and I'll take you up and you can see for yourself what it's doing. Well, the electrician probably thought, great, I get to go fly. <laughs> so, they, so they get in, but this pilot, being a little bit hot-headed, had decided that uh, he was going to give this annoying electrician the ride of his life. So he took him down really low, really fast, and was scaring the dickens out of this guy. But as he pulled up to clear a hilltop, he didn't quite get it right, and he, he clipped his tail on the ground. It didn't crash, but the shock was enough to completely eject the turret from the aircraft with the electrician still in it, and it went rolling down the hill. <laughs> now, the, the guy wasn't seriously hurt. According to my dad, he swore he would never fly in anything ever again for any, any reason. Now, this painting, which is, is right here, is, is kind of interesting because there's something special about that painting that I don't know. Because when I was a kid in the attic building my model airplanes, that painting sat in the corner in the attic. That was because my mum hated the frame and wouldn't allow it in the house. And you can see that a lot of the frames made up from pieces of old packing crates and things. This 
had been painted by one of my dad's fellow squadron members and given to him as a present for some, some reason. I don't know what that was, but it was pretty significant because my dad insisted that nothing about that painting could be changed, which is why it was stuck in the attic. So this is it exactly as, as it was given to him in, in sometime in 1942. I don't know what that story is, but there had to be something pretty dramatic associated with it. Anyway, that's there until the December of 42, so he's doing that for a total of... Uh, well, and, and in December of 42, he's, he's, made up to, he's been made up to sergeant. There's nothing in his records that said what that progression path was. It's just magically, he's now a sergeant. And... Um, uh, he, he was there until February of 44, so he was at, at Hawkins for about 18 months. Then in February of 1944, he gets assigned to the Southeast Asia Aviation Command and is uh, brought on board with 200 squadron and, and deployed to Yandam, Gambia. Before we get into that, this, this photograph is significant in a number of ways. The first is it's the only one I have in my, of my dad in full dress uniform. So you can see that now he's not only a sergeant, now he's a flight sergeant and he's air crew certified. <coughs> Again, I don't know what the path was, it doesn't tell you. <laughs> Next thing you see is my mum. So now you all know where my good looks come from. Yes. <laughs> the last thing you see is my oldest brother George, who I can assure you can be just as grumpy today. <laughs> Now the story that my dad told me about going to Yandam was he was flown into a different airfield. I, I suspect it was RAF Robertstown, but I'm not sure. And it was about an hour drive over to Yandam. So he's in a truck, gets driven over to Yandam, drives in there, and there's a guy waiting for him. The, the conversation went something like, are you Sergeant Bell? Yeah. Well, sign this. What am I signing? He says, it's just the transfer paperwork. You're my replacement. Sign it. I've got to catch that plane you flew in on. So dad signed it. Guy jumped on the truck. It took off back to the other airfield. Dad walked in and discovered that he's now in charge of electrical system maintenance for an entire squadron of B-24s. <laughs> he only had one problem. He'd never seen one of these up close. <laughs> <laughs> so, for anybody that uh, is unfamiliar with what a B-24 looks like, and th this is, uh, again, back to the two countries separated by a common language. Over here, this would be a B-24 Mark 8, uh, B-24H or J, depending on the manufacturing plant. To the RAF, it was a Liberator Mark 6. Next thing you'll find is that there are no squadron markings on this aircraft at all. There's only the RAF roundel and tail flash. And then the single aircraft identifier, P for Paul, not Papa because the radio telephony alphabet didn't come along until several years after the war. So they always had a single, single letter identifier and it's got the RAF style tail number, which is always two letters followed by three digits. Now this one's too fuzzy to read, but I think it's uh, something like MH763 or something like that. That's the format that's still used today. Uh, now to get into a Liberator, you, there's a little door around about here on the other side that you, a little access hatch you open, you reach in, pull the, the hydraulic handle and the bomb doors open. Because bomb doors in the B-24 don't swing outwards, they slide up the sides of the fuselage like a roll top desk. So Dad thought, well I'd better take a look at one of these things, so he, walked, he says the first thing he did, he walked out to the flight line, opened the bomb doors in one of these, and ducked down, stuck his head up in and let out a rather nasty profanity because he said he had never seen anything that complicated in his life <laughs> of, of cables and plumbing and, and uh, electrical harnesses. But back to the attitude of, well, well I'll just figure it out. Uh, I know this is a US one, so this is a B-24, it's not a Liberator. <laughs> they uh, put this up here because it's the only photograph I have from below with the bomb doors open. Because there's a couple of things uh, of note here. The first is that when you go into the B-24, if you're going into the front section, you go in here and there's two different levels of 
door you can go in depending whether you're going to the flight deck or through to the nose section. If you're going into the rear of the aircraft, you go up in here and in. If you have to get from the front to the back, this central spine, which is a structural member that the, the bomb racks are bolted to, is 10 inches wide. <laughs> you have to walk along that squeezing between the vertical rails and things, so you better not be too big. And doing that in flight with any turbulence had to be really, really hard. If the bomb doors were opened, it had to be absolutely terrifying. Other thing that you notice is that in the B-24, the uh, ventral turret was retractable because there wasn't enough ground clearance when it was on the ground. But for the coastal command liberators that my dad worked with, that turret was actually removed and replaced by a retractable uh, cover for the uh, uh, scanning antenna for the air-to-surface radar. So, how did 200 Squadron get liberators? Well, they, they, they started to receive them in July 1943, and because up, up to then they were using Lockheed Hudson's out over the Atlantic for anti-shipping and anti-submarine. The first operational sorties with Liberators began in August of 1943 and um, the transition had just been completed just prior to my dad's arrival in February of 1942. Now, a little diversion here, there's, at that t point in time there's uh, a claim to fame for 200 Squadron in that uh, and one of, the, one of the squadron's very first sorties with the Liberators it ended with the loss of the aircraft and posthumous award of a Victoria Cross, which was the highest award given. What happened there was there was a New Zealand pilot, uh, Trigg, who was on his very first sortie in, in a Liberator when he found a surface U-boat 240 miles off the coast. So, of course, he attacked it. Unfortunately, the U-boat's anti-aircraft fire was very, very good, and soon the Liberator was on fire. So if what Trigg did, probably knowing he was doomed, <coughs> was he just pressed on with the attack. He apparently passed over the submarine at about 50 feet altitude and dumped his entire load on it. <coughs> so he took out the submarine, but uh, then the Liberator crashed and with the loss of the entire crew. But during the crash, one of the, one of the Liberator's dinghies was ejected. And seven of the U-boat crew members survived by using that dinghy. And it was their testimony that led to, to Trigg's uh, Victoria Cross. That's significant because that's the only time in World War II that a Victoria Cross was awarded based solely on the testament of the enemy. So nothing to do with my dad, but it's, it's worth mentioning. Dad's been there for less than a month when the orders come through to move the entire squadron from Africa to Southeast India. It was the largest squadron move that had ever been attempted at that time. And it involved, it took 13 days and involved eight flights, durations between four and seven and a half hours each. And this is my dad's flight record from that, because uh, he was on uh, BZ-884 in for Nancy. Oh. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you take these uh, airfield names and translate them into today's geography, what you find is that they went from Ghana down to Nigeria, Nigeria over to Sudan, then up to Egypt, over to Iraq, over to Bahrain, over to Pakistan, and finally southeast across India to, to Madras. And St. Thomas Mount Airfield in Madras is now Chennai International Airport. So how did they go about doing that? Well, the, uh, 12 of 15 Liberators each carried eight crew members plus four passengers. The passengers would be uh, officers, other air crew, and senior NCOs like my dad. And my dad was on one of them, plus they, they carried a thousand pounds of personal kit and spares. The other three Liberators only had the eight crew members and they loaded up with spares and kit to right to their weight limit. Squadron was also assigned five DC-3 Dakotas uh, from Transport Command and that they carried 
uh, 86 essential personnel that would be needed as, as soon as the aircraft arrived, uh, plus additional freight up their, their load limits. The squadron did have a, had three more liberators, they had 18 total, but three of them were, were off on detachment at that time, so they followed later once, once they uh, finished their detachment stuff with eight crew and three passengers. And the, the remaining squadron personnel went by sea on the Sibijak Red. They arrived in early May, five weeks after everybody else. So that took the initial uh, squadron uh, personnel to 409 people. That later, over the next year, due to constant complaining of being their man grew to well over 500. I think at one point it was close up to 600, but uh, anyway. Now the primary mission was coastal defence. And so they were doing convoy escort across the Arabian Sea, down to the Indian Ocean, across the Bay of Bengal. Something that uh, a lot of US uh, generals didn't understand at this time was why the Brits had been so ferocious about fighting in North Africa and guarding the Suez Canal path. And a lot of people probably looking at it today might say, well, it was obviously for Arab oil. That's not true, because th throughout the course of the war, the Allied uh, use of oil for every seven barrels that were consumed, six of those barrels came from the United States. Only one came from Arab oil fields. So while losing one in seven would hurt, it would not have been disastrous. What people in the US at that point didn't understand was that unlike the US, the UK had no natural sources of their war materials like steel, aluminum, chemicals, blah, blah, blah. All of that stuff was coming from sources in Africa and, uh, and Asia. So that meant the, you had to be getting all that stuff to the UK as quickly as possible. Going round Africa would have added two weeks each way to the journey, plus exposed you for two weeks more to a German submarine attack. So this, uh, this was really important. Now, and then the sources of uh, all those materials were uh, locations of heavy fighting, so you had lots of military personnel that had to be fed with uh, ammunition, medical supplies and the like, so there was traffic both ways. It was really important all the way up into here because there's places like Pakistan and Bangladesh didn't exist at that time. They were all, all, all just India. Uh, but the, the, so there was all kinds of critical shipping activity throughout this area. And in addition to escorting the convoys, 200 Squadron was tasked with making sure nobody snuck into the squad to the convoy over. Uh, which did occasionally happen. And uh, obviously, if any, they, they, in parallel to doing the escorting, they would have different aircraft uh, flying area patrols. And obviously, if anybody detected or they got a report of uh, an enemy vessel, especially a submarine, then they would, they would go after it and, and attack it. And uh, my brother has a copy of the... Uh, menu from the uh, 1944 Squadron Christmas dinner where all the pilots have signed it and things. There's one was a, a USAF pilot, uh, Bob Taylor, I think his name was. After his name, bracket, I think, so I guess we know what his nickname was. <laughs> but one of the other ones uh, signed his name followed by, they send, we send them. <laughs> but, uh, but to do all this stuff, they were actually flying multiple missions every day, and it was a 24-hour operation because the ships don't stop and the sun goes down. And that's when the submarines come up to charge the batteries. <coughs> so, of course, Dad and his team, their responsibility was to ensure the serviceability of all the electrical systems on all the aircraft to make sure mission requirements could be supported. They also, as you can see, this is the main base that they had, which was uh, St. Thomas Mount. They also had uh, two other major detachments. One was in, in Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. And that was where the 354 and 160 squadrons were, were based, which were 200, 354 and 160 were all parts, uh, part of 225 group. And they would trade aircraft and crews as needed to 
depending on the mission needs. If, if these guys didn't have enough airplanes, they would send some down. Same with crews, same with maintenance personnel. So Dad spent quite a lot of time in Ceylon as well that uh, they, they spoke about uh, in various ways. But what they were doing out of Ceylon primarily was mine laying was a principal role. And they were flying over and laying mines as far south as way down here in, in Singapore and all the way up the Siamese coast, which is now Thailand, and up the Burmese coast, mining all the harbour entries and uh, river tributaries that the Japanese might be using as supply routes for, for their uh, ground forces in Burma. In addition to the mine laying, they would fly reconnaissance missions to try and keep tabs of what was going on. And uh, as needed, if a supply train or uh, convoy was detected, they would, they would uh, fly special bombing missions to, to uh, deal with them. This uh, was a particularly dangerous part of what they were doing because I know that there were at least three of the aircraft that were on these mine laying mi missions that because of weather changes, you might have imagined it was like 30 hours long, because of weather changes and wind changes, they literally ran out of fuel, didn't get, couldn't make it home. And there was, there was only one of those crews where everybody survived. They survived on the dinghies for I think it was two days. There was another one where six of them survived, one seriously injured, but six survived, but the dinghies were damaged. So they had to fight off sharks in the water for 40 hours before a Dutch vessel came along and rescued them and managed to shoot a whole bunch of the sharks. <coughs> They, uh, then they had another detachment up in Jasore, in, the, in what is now uh, Bangladesh. And what they were doing there in the early part was mainly chindit support for battles of Kahima and Imphal, which were pivotal in this, the, the ground war in this part of, part of the world. Because Kahima and Imphal, the Japanese had totally taken over Burma, and they were pushing up trying to uh, progress into India. If they had been able to take these towns, they'd have been able to uh, get onto and cut off the supply routes, rail and road supply routes, not only to the British fighters, but also to the Chinese that were fighting against the Japanese. This is on the west side of the, of the hump, you know, on the west side of the Himalayas. <coughs> Now, what the, what the Brits had done, there was a Brigadier Wingate who had formed these guerrilla groups called Chindits. And what they would do is they would uh, sneak deep into the jungle areas behind the Japanese and then come at them from behind, causing as much trouble and mayhem as they could. Of course, they needed to be supplied. There was no, no way to supply those except by air. So the 200 squadron out of here would fly the supply missions to the Chindits and drop them ammunition and medical supplies and food. Now the, in the course of these battles, the Chindits lost over 5,000 men, the, uh, to the Japanese losing about 7,000. And a large number of those losses were to starvation and disease. So this uh, su supply stuff, to, to keep our guys supplied, but, to make sure the Japanese aren't getting supplied was, was really what they were working on. Now later to, uh, in the, the talk here, I'll talk a little bit more, I'll mention it here, that later when they were operating totally out of Jasore, they were actually flying all the way down through Burma. They would typically fly down the coast, then fly in, because what they were doing was the main US and uh, the British uh, aircraft, it was US bombers, B-24s and others, and uh, British uh, uh, Hurricanes, typhoons, and uh, and Spitfires were attacking the main bases of the Japanese. But the Japanese had all kinds of splinter groups that were breaking off to escape and hide in the hills and things. So, so what uh, the Allies had were were groups that were tracking down and dealing with those guys. They needed to be supplied. And you couldn't contact them by radio because otherwise the Japanese would hear you. <laughs> so they, they frequently had to fly down, fly in and loiter for one, one and a half hours, depending on weather, to find the guys. They had uh, agreed uh, uh, light signals and stuff like that to, to locate them because you want to make sure if you're dropping supplies, you want to drop them to your guys, not the enemy that's right next to them. 
And so that, that was particularly dangerous when they were uh, loitering because now you're in the, all the anti-aircraft fire. And they did have a couple of aircraft that got that flew into mountainsides because of weather. They, they, when they were trying to find the guys, they just got it, got it a little wrong. So what was it like there? Well, when they first showed up in, in India, the arrival conditions were, let's just say, appalling. There were no billets ready. There was no security, not even filing cabinets or a safe. And remember, the radars, IFF gear and everything in these aircraft was very highly classified. So they had a ton of documentation that had to be kept safe. There was no mosquito netting provided in a high malaria area. <coughs> Officer quarters were bamboo shacks with rush matting. And the enlisted campsite was in a rice swamp. So let's just say nobody was happy. <laughs> So, first few days was consumed by guarding the aircraft while doing whatever was necessary to make available building space that could be used for offices and officer uh, quarters. Because what seemed to have happened was, in I think it was in 1942, St. Thomas Mount had been a, mainly a fighter base, but they had moved on as the war progressed. And what was left behind because of the Chennai seaport then it was a major supply route, so this base became a, a supply depot. And the people that ran the depot over the course of 1943 basically took over everything. So they had to be evicted to only what they needed. And the squadron also, as you use, obtained three, <laughs> 12 three-ton trucks for moving stuff around. And, and then they went and raided the 146 wing stores for provisions. So, things to do when they first got there. Well, first problem was aircraft serviceability. I think on arrival there were only four of the aircraft that were still deemed fully serviceable. And uh, one of the aircraft, uh, G for George, had actually had to emergency land in Bedar, which is about 100 miles northwest of Hyderabad, because it had a, a, a problem on its number three engine. <coughs> that was uh, particularly challenging for them because Bedar was an the airfield with zero facilities. So until they could be rescued, they had to sleep in the aircraft, make do with whatever provisions they had on board. So, so down in the, <coughs> at the main base, as quickly as they could, they got uh, aircraft ready to fly back and rescue them, and get, repair the aircraft and get the stores that they were carrying. Then they had to deal with the fact that all these broken aircraft had many failures, and this is all common stuff for B-24. They were notorious for generator and fuel pump failures, multiple leaks, especially fuel leaks, which is why they were so prone to going on fire. <coughs> they sort out all of that, plus there was, they had accumulated more than 50 hour, 54 hours of flight time, which in those days was a lot. Aircraft weren't nearly as reliable as today. So there's all kinds of scheduled maintenance that they had to catch up with. And uh, that was aggravated by the fact that a lot of the squadron personnel were still pretty new to the B-24, so they still required additional training and supervision. And uh, so throughout April of 44, the, the, the entire focus was on flying maintenance and training sorties to get everything back where it uh, should be. And they were able to start operational sorties on 5th of May, 44. So, for those few weeks, I expect that anybody involved in maintenance, including my dad, was pretty busy. But they had help from local kids and assisted them with just general chores like tidying up, cleaning, washing, washing clothes, making tea and the like. They did that for, uh, got rewarded with shared food and, and the like. And I'm pretty sure this is it's very fuzzy, but the, 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 I'm pretty sure they came from a local orphanage. And uh, Dad spoke really fondly of the young boy that helped look after him. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, all the photos you'll see from here on were taken by my dad using his, his camera, which was something akin to a box brownie. So there's zero adjustment of anything. There's no focus control or anything. It's just you hopefully remember to wind the film on, then you press the shutter, and you get what you get. Well, when they first arrived, medical facilities were a bit limited, <laughs> but they did know where they were because they had a GPS. 
<laughs> this I put in here for a couple of reasons. First, it lets you see one of the buildings that they secured space in. Because this airfield had no hangars. All aircraft maintenance was done out in the open. But they had buildings like this, and that's where they made office space and officer space and the like. I say that this guy that my dad's with is somebody important for a couple of reasons. The first is he obviously has officer style epaulette thingies on his shoulders. But um, more importantly, later in life I knew my dad to be one of the best scroungers I've ever come across. Uh, if anybody said something absolutely could not be got, somehow he got it. <laughs> and so my bet would be that this guy was probably the head of logistics and stores. <laughs> we would have wanted to be best friends with him. He also told me that the battery carts for starting airplanes were one of the most highly guarded items on the base. They had to be put under armed guard at night. Because if they didn't do that, Quite frequently their wheels were gone by the morning. <laughs> the local farmers and things didn't care about the batteries, they wanted the wheels. <laughs> the, uh, this also lets you see some more of those buildings in the background. And this is a typical type of maintenance trailer that they had, where they would take the, whatever needed repaired in to repair it, retest it, or make spare parts. And, And one day, this little boy helper that he liked so much, he decided to be kind and take him for swimming in the sea, which apparently the boy had never done. And then afterwards, my dad found out why when he came across this sign and, <laughs> and thought, oops. <laughs> <laughs> then there was the story of the monster snake. When I was a kid, and it made a closet under the stairs, it had a cardboard box in it with a rolled up snake skin and if we had been good we were allowed to unroll it about once a year. It was a python, python skin at least 14 feet long even after years of drying out and shrinking and my brother still has it. I wish he'd put something in this photograph to give you the scale of this thing because it's, it's huge. <coughs> anyway, apparently my dad had encountered this snake on a morning walk and ran back to the base terrified. When his young uh, boy helper heard what had happened, he burst out laughing and ran off. And about an hour later, he came back with the skin as a present for my dad. <laughs> there was a whole story how the boy managed that, but I won't bore you with that. <laughs> then there was the dagger. This was, Dad brought back a ceremonial dagger that was given to him by a tribal chief in Ceylon during a banquet dinner in the jungle. Dad really liked Salon and liked the people, they found them really friendly and apparently the, the squadron did lots of things to help the local villagers and, and tribes, probably giving them things like packing cases that had been unloaded and they didn't need anymore, and all that kind of thing. As part of a reward for that occasionally the, the tribes would invite them to a celebration dinner. Dad said the food at this thing was fantastic. But what was interesting was they had zero plates or utensils. Everything was served on large leaves and you ate with your fingers. So I guess they went green long before we did. <coughs> now this dagger was really impressive. It did all kinds of coloured weaving and embroidery and the blade was fully engraved. It was impressive as heck. And it was, the chief wanted my dad's sunglasses. So he offered him the dagger in exchange. Unfortunately, I had a, a brother with uh, kind of expensive dating habits and a lot of things like this disappeared to uh, help fund his adventures. <laughs> so what did he actually do? Well, he says, I don't really know, because he never spoke about it. But I can make reasonable assumptions from the, the things he did tell me about life on the ground and the things he brought back. Obviously, it was primarily ground maintenance, but I know that he also flew, and that's, he brought back his flight helmet, oxygen mask, and throat mic, and the helmet had the earphones built into it, so I used the helmet and throat mic to help me build an intercom between my bedroom and that of my best friend who lived next door, so that we could lie in bed at night and talk to each other, but that only lasted until my mum found out what I'd done. So, the, uh, 
He'd also occasionally start to talk about something in a mission, but quickly cut himself off and change it. Something like, there were war movies on TV all the time when I was a kid. And there might be something come up there and he'd say, you couldn't do that. The way I did it when we were over somewhere I'd never heard of, and he'd say, oh, never mind, it's just a movie. <laughs> and so I never got the story. <laughs> And then he brought back uh, crew operational manuals that would be used in flight. Uh, I've only got one of those left. But the, and uh, his, service, his service book, which is this thing here, uh, actually uh, notes him as a flight engineer. So, like I say, he never spoke about anything he did in flight. He only spoke about things on the ground. And he, he liked Ceylon, he hated Burma. <laughs> and uh, with, as I've said before, he and were responsible for keeping the serviceability of all the aircraft up. They had to support 24-hour missions. And uh, new personnel coming in, he would be responsible for training them and also moving among the three areas to make sure that any problems there are, are addressed, he'd, he'd go and take care of it. Sad thing is that I was too young to know what to ask to extract anything more. I've, I've got at least a thousand questions I wish I'd asked them and, you know, listen to everybody here, especially the young folks that can type like that, you know, after burner speed, even using more than two fingers. Please talk to your parents, your grandparents, whatever. Pull the stories out of them and write it down. The sequence and things doesn't matter. You can sort that later. Just get it on paper. It's so important. You might not care right now or think you're interested, but you will be one day. The one uh, flight crew manual that I have is this here for the, the autopilot. And for people that says, oh, that's a B-17. Well, it was the identical equipment on both the 17 and the 24. It was the same unit. It was the same boxes. Every, everything was the same. Just the locations on the aircraft, which this shows, changed a little bit. Now this, this manual is particularly interesting because uh, <clears throat> to engage the autopilot, apparently it's easy. Because <laughs> step one, you set all the controls to nominal. Step two, you turn on the power switch. Step three, you wait ten minutes. <laughs> it then carries on through and the whole procedure has 19 steps. <laughs> now, going back to how young some of these people were, you had to present things in a way they could understand and would remember. And so for the sensitivity control, it says if you set it too low, it'll be like your pilot is sleepy. If you set it too high, it'll be like your pilot has the DTs. <laughs> and then after you go through all this, you get it all set up, it's engaged, and it's running properly. There's a little paragraph uh, in the manual that says, after it's set, no further adjustments are needed unless flight conditions change. <laughs> There's a a uh, fighter pilot buddy of mine that uh, remember I'm saying that steady state flight conditions are a transient. <laughs> so my dad at work. Now well, here he is outside one, one of the uh, maintenance trailers. And here he is coming down from working on number two engine. So now you all know where I get my magnificent physique from. That's, except for the twins. But that's, and, the, and these are the shorts that he's wearing in those photographs. <laughs> so, and one thing that you m might have noticed if you've been paying attention to the uniforms, you won't have seen a zipper anywhere. Everything was, was buttons and buckles. So these are, that's RAF, World War II RAF issue tropical shorts. <laughs> then, there, I have at home a whole set of aircraft manuals. I only brought the one today, the, the electrical one, which is this thing here. Uh, this is well worth a look at. <coughs> the, uh, 
The uh, reason I didn't bring them all is there's seven in total, and they each manual covers an aspect of the airplane, hydraulics, armament, engines, you know, and that kind of thing. I brought the, the electrical one, because that's one my dad used most. What's fascinating about these manuals is it's written for 19, 20-year-old young airmen that knew nothing. And like the electrical one, the first chapter is uh, Electricity 101. It teaches you fundamental electrical theory and practices and basically trains you to be an electrician. The manual then progresses into detailed information for every wire, junction and piece of equipment on that entire airplane. How to, how to troubleshoot it, how to repair it, how to retest it and how to use it. <laughs> and uh, Remember that there were no computers back then, there was no, so there was no CAD systems, there were no graphics packages, there was no electronic publishing packages, everything had to be hand drawn. And uh, the, the detail of the diagrams and illustrations in here is just fascinating. Uh, now they did use a lot of photographs of the real aircraft, but even those had to be annotated by hand. And. Uh, Having spent over 40 years in the military aviation business, I can assure you that these things put today's manuals to shame. It's, it's really worth a look at. Another thing in these manuals that there was a big focus on, again, because of the young people, was safety. And the way they dealt with safety was by understandable cartoons. Things the young men would relate to and remember. Like, don't let yourself get distracted or bad things can happen. And I don't know if you can see what he's reading there, but we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be allowed to use that today. <laughs> and don't use gasoline to clean engine parts. Keep clear of propellers. <laughs> don't walk on wingtips. These are just some examples. There's tons of them in there. Of course, when I was a young boy, what I cared about most was the bomb system. Before I was eight years old, with, I could select, fuse, arm and release the bombs in any sequence in ground interval spacing you might want. <laughs> then of course, so the cockpit. Oh, and there's there's this, the autopilot uh, control panel I was just showing you. Interestingly, there, it's rotated 90 degrees and installed on its side. So I don't know if you had to operate it like this. But <laughs> But when I was a kid, I knew every switch, lever, knob and dial in there and all the pre-flight start-up, the run-up, take-off settings and limits. I just didn't have an airplane. Now anybody in maintenance, one of the first things you, get, you have to address is if something's not working properly, do I repair it or do I replace it? That's number one question. For aircraft repairs, my dad told me Many stories of aircraft returning with extensive damage, all kinds of bits shot off and, and things as we're all familiar with. Sometimes to the point that you weren't sure how they, how they made it home. He also told me that it wasn't unknown for a completely new aircraft to fly in, land and never fly again. What that was all about was if it was possible for them to do it, they would cannibalize the new aircraft to, replace, to repair the damaged ones. Partly because the air crews wanted to keep the one that brought them home and the one that they knew all its quirks and strange characteristics. But also, back to the logistics stuff, with one complete set of spares, a new airplane, you could repair several damaged ones. So it made a lot of sense. A couple of photos that my dad took in flight. There's this one again, no zoom lenses or anything here. This is just straight point and shoot. And the B-24 wingspan is 110 feet, so that thing was pretty darn close. <laughs> they were flying tight formation. <coughs> you see, this one is uh, EV-824, you can read that there, J for John. <coughs> the, uh, now this, this had to be an operational mission because this aircraft didn't join the squadron until about six months after the move to India. So it was no longer transit flying by that time. And uh, something you might have noticed already is complete absence of nose art. I don't know 
if uh, Coastal Command prohibited Noah's Ark, maybe regarded it as unprofessional or something, or if it was just that 200 Squadron didn't have anyone who could draw. I, I, I have no idea. Then took this photograph of the Taj Mahal, and they were obviously all so thrilled at getting to see that, that they went down for a closer look. Now that had to be fun in a B-24. <laughs> then of course the most important picture of all was his team. What you see here in the front is my dad, his superior officer, and this would have been my dad's counterpart because it was two, two leaders to, to run a 24-hour operation. They had 18 liberators, so there's 18 electrician airmen here, so they would I'm pretty sure the way that would have worked is each person owned an aircraft, a bit like a crew chief does nowadays. And, but they would also team up as needed because you might find that Jimmy was a whiz with magnetos, but you wanted Billy if he had a bomb release problem, and they would help each other out and do that stuff. Then in his uh, records came this mystery acronym. Because when I got his... Uh, the service records, they sent me a big word document with pages and pages of acronyms. But this one wasn't in it. Well, what's that all about? And he had a four-day assignment to BMH in uh, June of 44, and then a 12-day uh, assignment to number 18 BGH in November of 44. But after a bit of digging around, what I discovered was that BMH was British Military Hospital, and BGH was British General Hospital. Now my dad suffered from lifelong discomfort in his left leg and had a bit of a limp. Uh, I remember when I was very young, my mum taking me along with her to go visit him in the hospital because he needed an operation to fix something. And he also had this souvenir 20 millimetre round. It's, uh, by the way, it is safe, don't worry about that. <laughs> and uh, when I asked him why he had this, he said that it was a reminder of a close encounter with the enemy version, and that's all he would say. So he clearly didn't get hit by a, milli a 20 millimetre round, otherwise he wouldn't have a leg, but uh, it got close enough to do some permanent damage. So this one, by the way, this is uh, one of the rounds that was used in the wing cannons on Spitfires, Hurricanes, Mosquitoes, that kind of thing. And anything that had a 20 millimeter on board. Then, in September of 44, the squadron received two Liberators fitted with Lee lights. What this thing's all about is anyone that knows anything about radar obviously knows that it has a, a maximum range at which it's effective. A lot of people don't realize it also has a minimum range where the return pulse becomes indistinguishable from the transmit pulse because that's how radar works. You send out a ping, you time it coming back. And what this was, was that during the daytime that loss of signal when you're uh, uh, homing in on a submarine wasn't really a big deal because it, it, the radar worked until you got to within about three quarters of a mile of the target. By that time, the bombardier's Mark I eyeball had taken over and he's flying visually to attack the target. But at night, especially if it was an overcast night, a submarine would just disappear. So what this thing was, was a 22 million candle power spotlight that when, as the radar blip began to fade, the radar operator would tell the bombardier and he'd flip this thing on and it lit up the submarine like a Christmas tree. <laughs> so that was really successful, so they thought, we want more of those. So they ordered up the kit, and uh, in just after Christmas of 1944 through the end of January 45, 200 squadron was stood down so that the, all the crews could go through intensive training of how to use these things, and the maintenance guys could upgrade an additional six aircraft. This would have been a huge task because obviously the mechanics would have done the physical install and alignment, but the aircraft electrical system wasn't capable of driving something like this. So they had to install a huge bank of lead acid batteries 
Then they had to install a charging system to recharge those batteries, and then all the, all the switch and control gear and cabling to actually drive the thing. Uh, plus, uh, an early discovery was that the fumes from those batteries would cause severe corrosion inside the aircraft, so they had to install ducting and fans and all kinds of things for that. Probably wasn't very good for the crew to breathe either. But um, <laughs> So after they'd, they'd done this, uh, it was so successful that uh, by March, U-boat activity had almost gone to zero in their area. That sounds great. But it was actually it created a big problem because it created a big morale problem within the squadron because now they're flying these intensive long duration missions and finding nothing. So they're beginning to feel like they're useless, they're not doing their part for the war, they should be, and so on. As a result of that, half the squadron, nine aircraft, were, ded were moved up to Jasor and dedicated to special duty activities over Burma with the mine laying activities continuing from Ceylon. Then comes VE Day, 7 May 1945, Germany surrenders, next day is declared Victory in Europe Day. Exactly one week later, on the 15th of May, 200 Squadron is disbanded, re-stood up as number 8 Squadron. Uh, and the, it's now official, even though they've been doing it for about two and a half months, it's now official that they're operating out of Jasor. and they're now dedicated to support of the Burma campaign to clear the Japanese from Burma. That gets assigned to this 7008 servicing echelon. Now back in, in those days, I don't know if it's still the same today, but back in, in the World War II days, how this numbering scheme worked was the first digit, in this case seven, dictated the type of servicing echelon it was, and then the next three digits are the squadron number. If it had been 8008, it would have been a maintenance servicing echelon. A number seven, what they did was they operated as, uh, as close to and alongside the frontline troops. And as the front line progressed, then these aircraft and men would move with them to whatever new airfield had been secured. And th th there's, uh, in today's parlance in the US, this would have been either a task force or a special operations group. So in addition to bombing support as required, they were, they were uh, dropping supplies to the uh, guerrilla forces all over the jungle areas. And they were also making diversionary drops. Sometimes they would drop useless weaponry or something to help the Japanese think, hey, the next attack must be coming from there because they're setting up their forward area resupply uh, thing to a fart. Uh, in another case, one of the things they did was they dropped general purpose bombs with, the, with time delay fuses ranging from six hours to 36 hours. So every few hours a bomb would go off. And that was to make the Japanese think that there was some heavy duty uh, 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 demolition work or something going on in an area. And basically, have the Japanese where you wanted them. <laughs> now, the, the servicing echelon were assigned Gurkhas for personal protection while they were on the ground. If anybody doesn't know who the Gurkhas are, then they originate out of uh, Nepal and they're renowned for their ferocity in battle. There's a, a British uh, army general that was quoted as saying that any man who claims he's not afraid of dying is either a liar or a Gurkha. And I don't know what Dad did, but whatever it was, he was rewarded by being given a Gurkha knife. And uh, the these guys were pretty fanatical about some things too, so I guess I've just brought the curse upon myself. Because what they, what they uh, told my dad very clearly was, if the blade is ever drawn, it must draw blood before you put it back. And dad actually witnessed them using it to clear a path through some jungle shrub, then cut their own finger before putting it away. They really that stuff. So that's a World War II Gurkha knife. <clears throat> Then finally, on 26 October 45, he receives authorization for home embarkation. 
Now, Japan had surrendered on the 14th of August, but my dad got here for another two and a half months of fun in the jungle. <coughs> the, so how did this all end? Well, according to the officer commanding of the SE, then he was a pretty good chap <coughs> and, uh, and a very valuable man and all that good stuff. So his, his actual release with, was authorised on the 28th of October. The only catch there, th this is authorisation to stand by reserves, it's not discharged from the, from the Air Force. So 28th of October, his, his release is authorised and he's, he's given, granted 76 days leave. He must have been banking his vacation or something. <coughs> but what that means is that he's now not on reserves until 12th of January 1946, because <laughs> you've got to use up your leave first. <laughs> then we have his certificate of service. There's a number of things that are significant here. The first is some more complimentary words from his wing commander. But the things that get me is this is where you see in his aircrew category, his flight engineer. Next thing is his uh, commendations and medals. And it, these are, there's the Victory Medal, which probably everybody got just for, for surviving. The Defence Medal, which was for his service back in the UK, defending the homeland. Then the one that I consider uh, most significant is the Burma Star, because that was only awarded to people who actively partook in the campaign to clear the Japanese. But possibly most significant of all is this one right here which is mentioned in dispatches because that means for something that he did he was mentioned by name in the squadron report back to command headquarters in London. I don't know what it was, I haven't been able to track anything down online so for now I'm just assuming he did something good. <laughs> Here are his medals, there's the uh, uh, Victory Medal, the Defence Medal and the Burma Star. And this was his survival kit, which would have been on a lanyard round his neck. So it's got a compass and some matchsticks. Because given, given those and what you remember from reading that uh, survival book, what more could you need? Yes. <laughs> his final discharge from the reserves came on the 10th of February 1954, having attained the age of 45 years. But he became 45 two and a half years earlier in June 1951. So what this tells me is that the British government was just as efficient back then as it is today. <laughs> then it's back to family life. So post-World War II, he returns to the Scottish coal mining industry, but now he's at headquarters, helping lead the transition from DC power to AC power. And he and my mum had three more sons, uh, Bob lover boy John in 51, himself in 56. And here's a, a photo of, I remember this being taken. So, a <coughs> couple of things about this photo. First of all, before anybody says that I look just as grumpy as George did at the beginning, <laughs> then there's a good reason for that. Because we had gone to visit my uncle Bob at his house down in Draghorn. This is taken outside the back door of his house. Because you guys all wear a shirt and tie when you go to visit your brothers, don't you? I mean, this <laughs> some good manners. <laughs> uh, and I was happily playing Legos with my cousin Marilyn when I got dragged outside to have this photograph taken. I knew that as soon as my bag was turned, she was going to take the Lego bricks that I wanted. <laughs> so, so, so that's what, kind of things girls did back then. <laughs> then of course he died at home in Cross House in February of 81, he was 74. So a couple of things I remember about my dad. First is that I never heard him complain about anything or anyone. He always quietly sought the good in everybody. He was not religious. And if, but if anyone asked him for help, he couldn't say no. He would always say yes. He believed that if you do your best, then nobody can ask you for more, and you only need to answer to yourself. This sticks with me because in my first year at university, I failed one of the final exams, which meant I had to take a year out and then take it again the next year to get back in. 
The night before that retake, I was obviously nervous as heck. Dad came into my room to say good night. I saw how stressed I was and he looked at me and he said, just do the best you can. It's all you can do and you'll know if you didn't. And then he said good night and left. He seemed able to turn his hand to anything, whether it was something for our house, on his car, for our boat. He just he seemed to either be able to do it or figure out how to get it done. And he treated himself to a cigar every Christmas. <laughs> so some closing thoughts. The first one's pretty obvious. We all know the greatest generation reference was really earned. But something I feel very strongly about is that everybody played their part. And women don't get nearly enough recognition for the essential roles they played. There were so many, you know, the Roises, the munitions and other factory workers, farmers, mechanics, drivers, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's take a couple of minutes to tell you about my two favorites. The one is Mary. She was uh, an air transport pilot who flew over 1,000 missions in 76 different aircraft types. Now those women had a little book that fit in the breast pocket of their flight suit. That book, each page, had the key characteristics of a different aircraft type. If they were asked to fly an airplane they had never flown before, they had 20 minutes to familiarize themselves with the details before climbing in and cranking up. And she, she had all kinds of amazing stories. One of the best ones was when she delivered a Wellington bomber to, to a base and the ground crew held her at gunpoint while they searched the aircraft because they couldn't believe that she could possibly be the only person on board. <laughs> After the war, she became the uh, airport manager for Sandown Airport on the Isle of Wight. She was the first woman to ever do that. And she then married a wartime sweetheart and between them, they ran that airport until they retired. Then in the mid-2000s, I don't remember the exact year, for her 100th birthday, her kids brought in a two-seat Spitfire, and without any help, she climbed the rear cockpit, the RAF pilot took off, and shortly after takeoff, a single-seat Spitfire formated alongside them. It had flown over from Belgium specially because it was, it was a Spitfire she had actually delivered. The only way they knew that was it was the only time she ever wrote her name inside the cockpit. And she still felt guilty about that because it was such a naughty thing to do. <laughs> anyway, after, after he broke off, the pilot gave Mary control and she took a three-leg circuit around southern England. The only way she knew how, with a sectional map, the compass and, and the clock. And uh, at the end of that, she the pilot in front, sand down on the nose, you have control. He said, sure enough, they were perfectly lined up with the sand down runway. And he said, through that entire flight, the airspeed and altitude needles hardly moved. He said, he, he couldn't have done it. He said she was a far superior aviator to him. Then Beatrice Schilling is a different story. She was an engineer at uh, Royal Aircraft Establishment in, in Farnborough. Very unusual in those days to have a woman engineer. And a lot of you might know that the, the Merlin engine that we all knew and loved so well in Spitfires, Hurricanes, P-51s, Lancaster, etc., had a major Achilles heel. He journeyed pretty quickly. And that was because it was a carbureted engine. If you ever put any negative G on the aircraft, the, which if you're in the tail of an ME-109, he would dive. You try to dive and follow him, the float in the car would shut the fuel supply off, engine would begin to cough and splutter. As soon as it does that, the negative G goes away, the float drops, and this massive flood of fuel goes into the engine and stalls it completely. <laughs> so, and by the time you've sorted all that out and got it restarted, either the German's long gone, or he's now on, his, on your tail shooting at you. So it was a big problem. And they'd been working for months trying to figure out what to do about this. What Beatrice did, well, she calculated the maximum amount of fuel that the engine could consume at full throttle. And she took a washer and machined a hole 
in, in the middle that was the precise size that would only allow that much fuel through at maximum fuel pressure. And she put that where the fuel line bolted onto the card, she just put that washer there. Completely solved the stall and uh, known as Beatrice's orifice. But the uh, <laughs> but of course in 1940 then uh, men couldn't admit that a woman bested them for something they'd been tearing their hair out over. And finally, uh, especially in view of what's been happening for the last few years uh, here, we all need to remember that it's now our responsibility.